Chapter for 61, Volume 6, Chapter 49, Countdown to the End of Lying Dead. Translator, La 09. Yin Yi was surprised. Not too many of Noah's experimental subjects had managed to survive, after all, the term experiment naturally carried the meaning of uncertainty and instability. Pao Nan had let Noah implant a mutated branch of the world tree inside his body, and since Noah inherited Negari's personality, he would definitely not grant others any safe powers that could be used right now. He only ever granted items or knowledge that required adaptation and modification by the individual to be usable, or the power had flaws that put the user into a dangerous situation, only by surpassing one's limit would they be able to truly obtain that power. Additionally, since the Celestials already had a natural path of growth, choosing to ask Noah for power was actually a shortcut, so the limit they had to surpass was greater than normal. Observing the bloody mist in the sky, Yunyi quickly stopped worrying about Po Nan. This was because they were all walking the path of eternal peace, and the most basic quality of any traveler on this path was the willingness to pay for their own choices. Po Nan understood the consequences of his actions, but he still fearlessly decided to make that decision. This meant that Po Nan had the courage to shoulder the consequences, and the only thing Yunyi could do for him was to respect it. His duty right now was to search for the serpent and settle their debt. Regarding the serpent's background, Yun Yi and the Celestials had done plenty of research and arrived at the conclusion that no matter the scenario, it was definitely related to Meng Luo the individual. Even in the final moments, a confrontation was inevitable. Badam. 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 As this rhythmic beating reverberated, Yun Yi also saw his target, a crescent-shaped blob of flesh. The blob of flesh had numerous eyes all over it that contained thick black venom, which looked almost like a beating heart. And Po Nan also appeared in front of this blob of flesh, as he clenched his fist, the air around him almost seemed to shatter. The shattered air created friction that caused an arc of lightning to move around Po Nan's deity statue. Yih, following Po Nan's swung fist, all the supernatural phenomena vanished, the entire force had been concentrated into his fist and transferred into the blob of flesh. The part of the blob that was struck simply sunk inward, showing that this thing wasn't nearly as fragile as the snakes from before. At the same time, the blob of flesh also retaliated as an immense force shot back from where it was struck, causing the deity statue's fist to shatter, spreading the impact up its entire body. At this very moment, Po Nan looked like a cracked porcelain doll as he was sent flying backwards. Yun Yi shot out a machine that gently attached itself to Po Nan's back and produced thrust to push him away. The part of the blob that was sunken in did not recover, and the frequency of the rhythmic beating became more rapid, accompanied by numerous voices from inside. IT hurts. IT hurts. IT hurts. It was as if millions of people were shouting directly into his ears, although the shouting wasn't very loud, although it wasn't in unison, and although it was a very weak shout, each of them made him feel both their helplessness and suffering. Their voices had already gotten so weak that they didn't even have the strength to shout anymore. But when numerous voices reverberated this way in one's ear, one would only feel that internal horror and even personally feel that soul-aching pain. This sense of pain was growing increasingly greater. While Yin Yi had originally been able to endure it, the suffering instantly shot up so much that he almost wanted to scream as well. Every last bit of his body felt like it was being permeated by the pain, and the same was happening to his mind as well. Every single unspeakable act that had ever occurred in the past appeared in his mind at the same time, directly striking his very core, stimulating old wounds of both kinds, causing him even more pain. The blob of flesh speeding grew increasingly greater, the sound it gave off also became increasingly rapid until it turned into static noise similar to old TVs, which was simply unbearable. Yuni uttered a curt groan and clutched his forehead, 
countless wounds appeared all over his body, blood was flowing from his eyes, mouth, and nose. At this level, pain wasn't just a sensation anymore, as it had affected his body in return. The beating blob of flesh began to distort and shapeshift, eventually becoming a formless mass of broken pieces that somehow still remained attached to one another. Join us, feel the pain, get accustomed to the pain, enjoy the pain, and finally, become pain, the mass of broken pieces uttered in a heavy mix of many voices, the clearest of which belonged to Meng Luo. Barely enduring the pain to stand back up, Yun Yi looked at the figure of broken pieces. He seemed to be able to see Meng Luo's form in there, of course, together with many other desolates as well. Perhaps, this thing could be called the desolate corpse, as it was more or less something created from the pain and suffering of all the desolates as they died. You are also a desolate, you should also become a part of us. Not only that, not just the desolates, I want to pull even more beings into this pain as well Meng Luo seemed to be trying to persuade Yun Yi. At least, that was what Yun Yi had heard from his sense of hearing that was nearly collapsing from the pain, it could, of course, just be his own hallucination under the extreme pain. I can feel it. I feel your heart that is filled with fear, a heart that had never been at peace. Regardless of whether or not it was a hallucination, Yun Yi pushed a button on his equipment to take out an injection pen and injected himself with some fluid. This alleviated Yun Yi's pain somewhat and made it possible for him to make that statement. Meng Luo was born and raised as an inferior desolate, which left him with an immense feeling of inferiority, especially after coming into contact with the beast tooth. The feeling of carrying an important treasure had only made his sense of inferiority grow even stronger. Everything he had ever done up to this point was for the sake of feeling safe and at peace. Meng Luo originally had an opportunity to walk the path of eternal peace, but he gave up on it, so his path of pursuing inner peace became warped. Power and authority could give him a sense of safety, but it was only a means to an end, and he was unable to look into himself and achieve that end. Entrusting his entire feeling of safety in power and authority could only be described as mixing up the means and the end. While this might seem like the pursuit of peace, the further one proceeded down this path, the less peaceful they'd feel. In the serpent's weakest state, its everything seemed to have opened up for all to see, and since Meng Luo was originally the center of the serpent, his everything went on full display for Yun Yi to see. Become one with pain. The broken desolate corpse gradually approached him. If Meng Luo was in a normal state, he might have reacted to Yun Yi's words with anger or insanity, but he was now connected to the souls of too many desolates. If it wasn't for the beast tooth, he wouldn't have been able to maintain even this little bit of consciousness left. His individuality had faded to a terrible degree, his mind filled with fear and unease, thus having no room to think about Yun Yi's words. Then let's die together. Yun Yi had implanted a countermeasure in his body that would activate as soon as his consciousness faded over a certain degree. God's Guidance, Modified Edition Yun Yi had included his own understanding into Lan Shan's product, making his own creation which he put into his body. As the desolate corpse embraced and pulled him into the mass of pain, his consciousness quickly became overwhelmed by pain and suffering. He could feel the countermeasure device activating, but he discovered that he wasn't feeling fearful at all. His consciousness surpassed what remained of the desolates, progressing one step further due to surpassing his limit. This consciousness phenomenon sparkled around his body briefly before the corresponding factors poured towards the cycle of reincarnation within the ancestral world. The glorious golden mass of light twitched briefly as if the universal string of truth had just been stimulated. Chapter 462, Volume 6 Chapter 50, Resurrection Translator La 009. The modified version of God's guidance that Uni created had a smaller blast radius, but the influence it exerted was much greater compared to normal ones. 
Additionally, there was no such thing as a backdoor anymore. Anyone who remained within the range of the explosion would have no choice but to endure the full extent of the blast. In the instant of the explosion, everything seemed to have ground to a halt, and the world fell into a frozen state. Or rather, for Negri, this world's operation could no longer interfere with his flow of time. In Negri's vision, his own entire existence became clear to him, his form of life had finished evolving, and the seed of truth that was created from nothing but knowledge had thoroughly bloomed into a gigantic tree whose branches and roots extended throughout every bit of his existence. Negri's eyes could now see the movement of the universe. In a place that living beings couldn't possibly observe, there was an indiscernible river, a humongous system that stretched across infinite worlds. The river seemed to be constantly flowing. With its every movement, numerous sprites of light would emerge from the river and flow into the numerous surrounding worlds. At the same time, a similarly large number of sprites of light would emerge from those worlds and flow back into the river. Those are origins. Negari had such an epiphany. And this river could be called the river of beginning, the end of origin, the cycle of reincarnation, or the string of truth. It was the basic frame of this multiverse, the extension of all blueprints, and the basis for all life to form. After that, Negari could faintly sense numerous ineffable existences within that indiscernible river, but Negari could only see a short part of the river that had resonated with him. With manipulation at the core and other knowledge supplementing it, a structure that surpassed the imagination of living beings that was connected through numerous aspects of reality formed into a branch of the river a tributary. At the very moment that the tributary's structure was complete, Negari felt a sense of sublimation. He could tell that while he remained in a lesser sand realm, no matter how this world's matter moved, it would still be unable to pull him along and cause changes to him. In other words, the concept of time within any lesser realms was now ineffective to him. He could easily achieve literal eternal life in any lesser realm. If he so wished, he could reveal a tiny bit of his essence and cause any life forms affected by it to also be unaffected by time in a lesser realm. It was no wonder pathway entities were largely unwilling to remain in lesser realms, as their growth would become stunted to a horrifying degree. Negari could also sense the river tributary of his pathway constantly creating new, origins, which seemed to be a function of the string of truth. At the same time, although these, origins, were created in his tributary, their creation encompassed the entire corresponding truths of the universe, at most, Negari's pathway tributary had only affected them a bit greater compared to normal. If Negari wanted to, he would be able to mark each and every, origin, that was created within this tributary. By following them, Negari would be able to find new world coordinates. Of course, since there were, origins, created here, there were naturally also, origins, that returned. Negari could easily discern these returning, origins, to be from the same group that had just been created earlier. These, origins, that had traveled to other worlds and remained there for a year, or just a few months in his vision, had actually lived for an entire life thanks to the difference in time flow of each world. Glancing at these, origins, Negari found that they did not bring back anything useful at all, and even if more of them returned, it would still be similarly meaningless. Then how about this? Negari placed a small portion of his power into a newly created, origin, and let it freely reincarnate. His attention also followed the new life of this, origin, thanks to the power he imbued within it. That, origin, proceeded to enter a world with a feudalistic society. Because it carried a portion of Negari's power, he was born extraordinary, being hailed as a genius since birth. By the time he was twenty-one years old, he discovered a certain fact, he seemed to have stopped aging. His physique, his body state, everything seemed to have been solidified at twenty-one years of age, time seemed almost helpless to affect him. 
In order to not expose this truth, he initially had his family members cover this up and only ever left the house with a fake beard. Eventually, when concealment was no longer possible, he faked his death and changed into another identity to continue living. In the beginning, he was silently delighted, but after his peers began to grow to 70 to 80 years old, after the love of his life had committed suicide due to being unable to accept her aging, and after his comrades and friends eventually died of diseases or of old age, this delight disappeared without a trace. His descendants continued to grow in number, from one generation to the next, but his familial attachment to them became gradually thinner. Eventually, all of them seemed like strangers who took advantage of one another for profit, even though all of them called him their ancestor. Of course, he had also felt despair and tried to commit suicide, but regardless of how he died, he would only remain dormant for a period of time. Once that time had gone by, his body would simply recover. The very first time he died, he slept for over thirty years before he climbed out of his grave, almost scaring his great-great-great-grandchild to death. As the years went by, he discovered that the better his body was preserved, the shorter he had to sleep, and vice versa. In this manner, he lived from feudal society all the way to the modern age. He had lived in insanity, as a hero, as a tyrant, as a great monk, as a free spirit, as a vigilante, as a renowned merchant. In the end, the only thing he had left was indifference. After a thousand years of longevity, he could finally feel the power that supported his immortality disappearing, followed by his consciousness being pulled somewhere unknown. Is this heaven? Or hell? While he was thinking this, he was gently received by a hand, who seemed to be judging him. Garbage. Without waiting for him to react, his consciousness was thoroughly erased. Looking down at the, origin, in his hand, Negri shook his head. Having been imbued with a part of his power, other than a slightly stronger will than normal and relatively eventful life, this individual didn't manage to achieve anything of note. What else was he but garbage? Even if that was a no-magic world, following Negri's thought process, if Negri was given the same conditions, he would have already released his, origin, and researched a method to transmigrate to another world. Negri had even left a set of world coordinates within that bit of power, if that individual had been able to utilize the power to a certain degree, he would have been able to notice those coordinates. This was the same rule he adhered to for all his experimental subjects by leaving one path of survival. If he had been able to follow those world coordinates and travel to that world, members of the impure hermit order would be waiting to happily receive him. But in the end, he got immersed in his sense of superiority as an immortal, unkillable person, wasting his entire life in a single world being sorry for himself. He should have been able to sense the power that maintained his immortality the first time he committed suicide, but never tried to seriously dig deeper into it later on. While he claimed to hate immortality, he had never tried to actually explore that power to change it. The arrogance of being immortal had clouded his eyes. While Negri was researching how to use, origins, to earn himself more power, part of his attention was also dealing with the aftermath of the desolate sacrifice world. Yun Yi had sacrificed his life to ensure the serpent's death, but before his soul was destroyed, Negri had fished it out and put him back into the ancestral world's cycle of reincarnation to incubate once again. By the time he was resurrected, the desolate sacrifice world's name had been changed to the totem world. The natural shortcomings of the celestials who had been living here had also been remedied. The name Celestial that had originally been used to distinguish themselves from the desolates due to their differences was no longer necessary, as they could now simply be called humans without any distinguishing features. The only difference was that those who had begun to walk the path of eternal peace would automatically join the celestial department. While Yun Yi was walking on the sidewalk of a neat and clean street, watching the vehicles that traveled back and forth, 
smiling as he saw two other people standing next to a nearby car. While juggling a pair of bright red daggers in his hand, Yun Rong noticed Yun Yi and patted the top of the vehicle, after which a person with a half-withered appearance peeked his head out from inside, Po Nan. Their previous battle had left him with a permanent change in the essence of his life form, which couldn't be said to be either a good thing or a bad thing. How's the current situation? Yun Yi quickly approached and received the pair of glasses in Po Nan's hand and asked. Everything is well. The totem world has completely stabilized, our population grows by the day. Most menial tasks can be done through the AI machines, so we're all a bit free right now, Yun Rong's speaking grew increasingly faster. While he didn't mean to retort or complain, everything that left his mouth felt like a complaint. And that's why the three of us have some special orders, Po Nan took out three bags of documents and handed them to each of them. This is? From what I know, had in the desolate, the totem world already suppressed the few resistance forces it had remaining. Yin Yi received the bag of documents and asked. That's why our orders aren't within the totem world. This is a job from a certain wealthy individual in the impure hermit order. They found a new world suitable for their organization, but the natives are a bit difficult, so they hoped that our celestial department would be able to cooperate with them, Po Nan replied. After reading everything, Yun Yi entered the vehicle and smiled, then what are we waiting for? My bones have practically gone stiff during the entire time I was in the hospital. Some nuances were lost in translation here. Both the desolates and celestials originally had the suffix, human, in their Chinese names, but that suffix was removed for the sake of better reading. As mentioned a few chapters ago, both the desolates and celestials were still only slightly better than regular humans, unlike elves or other long-lived races. Chapter 463, Volume 7 Chapter 1, Skeleton Translator, La 009 a flourishing meadow of grass. Negari was wearing a simple black feather robe while standing barefooted in the grass. Standing next to him was Lan Shan who was narrowing her eyes in a good mood as she held up a parasol for Negari. Is this where you came into existence, my lord? Lan Shan scanned through this area, not noticing anything unique about this location. Ah, you can say that as Negari waved his hand, a set of dried bones emerged from the grass. Seeing this skeleton, Negari slightly frowned. A thousand years had gone by in the flame world. Except this time flow wasn't very accurate at all, since if he took the original time flow of the flame world into account, a few ten thousand years should have already gone by. After Negari invaded the world's information sea, this was the conclusion he had drawn. After Nola ignited the first flame once again, it only burned for 300 years. The Age of Flames officially came to a close after those 300 years, followed by 300 years of the Age of Turbulence. This current age was 400 years after the end of the Age of Turbulence, which was called the Age of Metal. In this era, everyone believed their bones to be created from metal, which had given birth to a new system of power. In that case, the so-called age of metal must be a result of those entities' experiments as well. From what he could tell from eternal heat and life bearers fusion into eternal light, the indescribable entity that was the white light had been experimenting with a single topic, the fusion of powers. In that case, his understanding of the white light and black abyss collision that created the flame world should probably be adjusted, although Negari fully expected this adjustment to also be faulty as well. Due to the shift of the eras, the flame world's fire characteristics seemed to have weakened, as time was now moving at an exceptionally slow rate, almost the same as other sand realms. Of course, regardless of whether a thousand or ten thousand years had gone by, the fact that this skeleton remained up to this point was already an anomaly. There are two possibilities. Firstly, Wang Yuan's world itself wasn't simple, 
most likely not just a normal sand realm. Wang Yuan's understanding of his own world wasn't particularly deep, so Negari didn't have complete knowledge of it either. Although he had sent someone over to investigate, the investigator's range of motion was limited and was unable to discern the world's unique characteristics. And the second possibility was that Wang Yuan's skeleton was purposely left here. The age of metal, and metallic bones, what a great coincidence this was. If Negari hadn't confirmed that the world's misfortunate characteristic was still in effect, he would have thought that those entities wanted to create a protagonist with a golden finger, the bones of God. Or perhaps, both of them are true. Negari carefully observed Wang Yuan's skeleton. It currently had a certain level of similarities to Meng Luo's beast tooth, which were things that carried a higher essence compared to the world itself. The world that Wang Yuan once lived in was definitely not a greater realm, but that world must have had its own unique characteristics. With a wave of his hand, Negari took the skeleton. Meng Luo's beast tooth was now in Negari's hand. The reason for its high quality was the fact that it was the unique catalyst for a greater realm. Dim silence had received even more damage than previously expected. At the time, Negari was facing a great threat in eternal light, so he had triggered the countermeasure he left inside Dim Silence while he still could. At the time, Dim Silence had a temporary truce with Negari, so he was about to borrow the Beast Tooth Catalyst to head into a greater realm, taking advantage of the greater realm's natural isolation to cut off both his covenant with Negari and the countermeasures Negari had implanted inside him. In the end, he was one step too slow. Negari's countermeasure managed to interrupt his ritual, causing his newly formed body to instantly die. What remained of his consciousness was also caught by Eternal Light's white flames attack that was meant for Negari and once again fell to his deathbed. Using what remained of his capabilities, he attracted the protagonist to have the beast tooth become Meng Luo's golden finger, thus ensuring his own safety. Dim Silence's original plan was to wait for the protagonist to succeed, then absorb some sort of energy source energy was his best option, then resurrect again. He had very few choices left except to hope that the protagonist would fare as best as possible. Meng Luo didn't disappoint him either, as a large amount of source energy was indeed collected for him to absorb as he wished when all the desolate totems were devoured. Unfortunately, under those circumstances, he couldn't do anything at all. He'd have a death wish if he tried to absorb and use that chaotic source energy, resulting in him being assimilated and becoming a part of that serpent if nothing unexpected had happened. In the end, dim silence could only turtle up and wait. Once Negari showed up later on, he effectively lost all options and was summarily erased. However, even while Negari personally erased Dim Silence, he could clearly feel that this guy hadn't actually died completely yet. His ability to divide his own existence was simply too potent. First a corpse in the Moon Tree world, then another corpse in the inexistent world of the SCR world, then he managed to continue laying dead in the desolate sacrifice world for a while. Not only that, the Beast Tooth was present in the desolate sacrifice world because he had actually obtained it before and knew exactly how to use it, which meant that he might have also gone to the greater realm connected to the Beast Tooth and left a corpse there as well. This guy's understanding of alternative aspects of reality was exceptional, and considering that he wasn't an expert fighter, most of his efforts were most likely spent on various ways he set up to protect his own life. This was evident in how he managed to discover the inexistent world in the SCR world, but instead of trying anything else, he had sealed a part of his own existence within it, thus being able to resurrect after his original body had died. Most likely, he did something similar in the greater realm as well. Clearly, Dim Silence's capabilities, wits, and even talents were exceptional, but he was simply unlucky. He was born in the elven race with a decent essence of life form and relatively great talents, 
but he had the moon tree over his head, which made sure that he had to form a covenant with the moon tree in order to achieve his pathway. While the moon tree world was growing stronger, the seven gods arrived, killing and forcing him to lay dead in the aspect of silence. After finally getting a chance at resurrecting, he fell into a trap, losing this moon tree world authority to Chromi and what remained of his power to Dar. And then after finally resurrecting in the SCR world and recovering a bit of his strength, he was caught by Negari when he was about to flee. After paying a heavy price to escape from Negari's hands and arrive in the desolate sacrifice world, just as he was about to successfully escape, he was killed by Negari once again. And when he tried possessing the beast tooth to help the protagonist, the protagonist ran into an unprecedented issue. It was as if the only choices available to dim silence at all times were a terrible choice and a horrible choice. Just thinking about it, even Negri felt sorry for him. After retrieving the beast tooth, Negri summoned Lan Shan to accompany him back to the flame world. The first reason was that he wanted to visit, considering how deep the murky waters in this world were, and secondly, he needed to borrow this world as a springboard to head into Wang Yuan's original world. Since he had returned, it was only appropriate for him to visit a few old friends. Although people who could be considered his old friends were practically non-existent during this age of metal, there were still two of them. Within the new Roya's kingdom, a certain statue seemed to have sensed something and woke up. He was able to feel an ominous but familiar presence. In the garden of a certain manner, the statue of a sword-wielding young girl remained still as it had always been. Chapter 464, Volume 7 Chapter 2 Changes. Translator, La 009. Cor 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 cor. A large number of crows flew across the sky, then one of them descended and landed on Negri's outstretched finger. The sharp claws gently wrapped around Negri's finger. This member of the terrifying species called the Death Crows was now intimately rubbing its head against Negri's hand. Yayu welcomes Master's return. The crow spoke. Negari had now become a pathway entity, so even while he didn't purposely make his pathway radiate its information, these crows had already begun to change, since they carried a mutated form of the original germs that Negari brought into this world. To be exact, ever since Negari set foot onto this world once again, the germs inside their bodies had already begun to change. The crow that proclaimed itself to be Yayu who was perched on Negari's hand had even achieved sublimation, this was because its origin belonged to the manipulation domain, a part of which was now under Negari's management. That was why Negari was its master, even if only in name, and why it had benefited the most from Negari's return. The release of its bloodline had allowed the crow to obtain wisdom and knowledge that surpassed normal people. It was currently the leader of a flock of death crows with over 10,000 members, so as soon as its bloodline mutation ended, it brought its flock to welcome Negari. So many of them, then there's no need for this parasol anymore, although the smell can use some improvement. Lan Shan commented as she looked up to the jet black sky. These crows did not benefit nearly as much as Yayu, even their wisdom hadn't been fully unlocked but the pressure from their bloodline was more than enough to stop them from being noisy. Of course, with them being a large flock of birds, the smell wasn't going to be pleasant. Back then in Raystromia, the crows were very self-aware and made sure to clean themselves, but these crows had been left alone in the wild for over a thousand years already. As Miss Lanshan wishes, Yayu will make sure to pay attention to this. The knowledge from its bloodline allowed Yoyu to recognize Lan Shan and the other aspects of Negari, as well as a limited level of understanding regarding Negari's forces, so it ordered the flock of crows to fly a bit higher as it heard Lan Shan's words. During his research of the origins, Negari had profoundly understood the importance of vision. In the beginning, his practically insane method of advancement was also due to his limited vision 
and that immortal who obtained Negari's power couldn't even take the first step after 1,000 years was also limited by his own vision, clinging onto the arrogance of an immortal and refusing to improve. For that reason, to ensure that his subordinates wouldn't be crippled garbage, the information he initially taught them now only included knowledge regarding vision. What considerable changes! As the crows flew into the distance, Negari brought Lan Shan and Yayu with him towards his destination. Observing this changed world, even he couldn't help but lament. Additionally, through the comparison of the past and present, he was also further tempering his will, as this was the meaning of emotion's existence. This thousand-year change all began from the moment that Nola rekindled the first flame. The approach of the Black Abyss brought numerous monsters with it, although most of them had already been eliminated by the White Light's approach after Nola rekindled the first flame, some still remained. Afterwards, a huge plague occurred within the Intercom Kingdom, followed by the loss of the Church of Divine Grace's ability to grant their graces. These two disasters caused the Intercom Kingdom to become greatly weakened once again. On the other hand, the great King Eldridge of the Royas Kingdom manifested as a spirit, so without hesitation, the Royas Kingdom ripped their previous peace treaty up and proceeded to invade Intercam. Royas still ended up becoming an empire, and the radiance of the great King Eldridge illuminated the land, but this radiance only lasted for 300 years. Eventually, even the rekindled first flame ended up being snuffed out, and not even Eldridge managed to save the world this time around. The first flame had gone out too quickly, so there wasn't even ash left to burn, fortunately, the Black Abyss did not descend this time, as if both the White Light and the Black Abyss had thoroughly given up on this world. However, the consequences of the first flame being snuffed out still manifested themselves. Large-scale diseases began to plague the world, killing a large number of people every day. The Royas Empire ended up collapsing under these circumstances, as even Eldridge seemed to have lost his powers. The upheaval of the era persisted for 300 years, greatly decreasing the world's population. The Age of Metal slowly came into existence, the advent of which was the gradual ineffectiveness of the Age of Flames, respiratory art. As this system of power spread out during the Age of Turbulence, it slowly turned into Bone Forge art. Everyone began to dig for humanity's own latent powers, improving their constitution through physical training, fighting off the disease, as well as the portion of Black Abyss monsters, Dragonborn demons, and Crow demons. While Negari had brought the majority of his troops with him to the final battle, some crow men and dragon men still remained in this world. Unlike the ghost men whose powers didn't correlate to their bloodline, these people could still pass on their powers through their bloodline, and once the first flame died out, they also underwent mutation. According to what Negari could sense, there were still descendants of crow men and dragon men in this world, but unlike the death crows, these humans had their own sense of self and were affected to a much lesser degree. Additionally, they seemed to also resist their bloodline, leading to them receiving very little information. Who would have thought there would be a day when my experiments are said to be a cursed bloodline? Negari was observing history, seemingly watching something highly interesting. Where he was observing, there was a story about the love and tragedy of a dragon men's descendant, a dragonborn. In the end, he was forced to use his cursed bloodline to turn into a dragonoid monster, saving his village while leaving another mark of the dragonborn's tragic history. Even ghost men still existed in this world. Negari had left a total of six ceremonial blades in this world, so through trial and error, some people eventually managed to figure out how to create ghost men, although there were still differences compared to the originals. So Rhea has been destroyed as well. Negari was currently standing inside a certain city. The area that Negari originally constructed had already been destroyed shortly after Negari left, the ruins of which this new city was built upon. 
the Korchi people never managed to complete their dream of a unified nation. During the Age of Turbulence, this race of people started to exist only in name, as they were assimilated by the bigger tribes, at this point, very few people still remembered themselves as being Korchi. Remember, the bone is the origin of your blood. Bone Forge Art will modify your bones to manifest a tough characteristic, allowing your blood to eventually flow throughout your entire body and provide strength. And only those with a strong body will be able to become a pugilist. On an empty plot of land outside the city, a middle-aged man was explaining to a group of ten-odd years old children. If Killer J or Yin Rong was here, they'd definitely say something about how this was the typical beginning of a fantasy novel. A brat with firm eyes would definitely be among these children, who would be the eventual main character. During this era, bone forge art wasn't particularly rare, as everyone knew about the foundational basics. What wasn't public knowledge were the various schools of techniques that were developed with bone forge art as the basis. Where should we go next, my lord? Lan Shan asked him from the side. Unlike Noah and Killer J who were born here, this was her first time in the flame world, so she was extremely interested in everything here. Let's go to the new Roya's kingdom Negri replied. At the end of the Age of Flames, the Roya's empire fell to ruins, but during this Age of Metal, the new Roya's kingdom had been established, so Eldritch had most likely gotten accustomed to the changes of the new era and obtained power once again. The name literally means crow feather. Chapter 465, Volume 7 Chapter 3, Everything is Me. Translator, La 09. Sitting on a horse carriage, Lan Shan was observing Negri with slightly narrowed eyes, she was in an exceptionally happy mood. After becoming a pathway entity, Negri had been spending a lot more time with her, even if this wasn't the complete him. After Negri achieved his pathway and the essence of his life form had advanced further, he was germs, he was a living creature, he was a phenomenon, and he was also a way of thinking. The current true Negri was so grand that it was nearly impossible to completely observe him. The current humanoid Negri in front of Lan Shan was only a manifested form that she was able to observe. Everything is me. The negary one could observe would always only be a part of him, his behavior was merely the display of a part of his entirety. Similar to how most people could only observe a magician's hands and what they were doing instead of the magician as a whole. And so, the negary who accompanied Lan Shan carried slightly more emotions than usual, but even that much had made Lan Shan feel happy unlike never before. Ever since that moment when he offered his hand to her within those ruins, Lan Shan had already sensed that she was complete, but also incomplete at the same time. Lan Shan as a person was incomplete, but the Lan Shan who served and remained by Negri's side was complete. During this age of metal, other than the new Roya's kingdom, the other kingdoms did not have many relations to the age of flames, and no particularly powerful nation had ever appeared. At the moment, there were about a dozen large and small countries governing this continent. What was surprising was that Nola's legends continue to be spread even today. After Eldridge established the Roya's empire, he did not erase Nola's contributions and instead began to publicize her to a certain extent. Her determination and her justice had been passed down to the present day, where everyone knew it by heart. For that reason, Nola was hailed as the goddess of protection within the new Roya's kingdom, where statues of her were erected. The statues depicted a young blonde girl wielding a knight's sword while clad in armor, although the facial features weren't exactly the same. Apparently, they were sculpted using Nola's younger half-sister as the basis. Eventually, Nola's mother remarried. Even though Nola had given up her life for the world, the Tagula family could not end during her generation. And so, the Night Rivers and Isabella had a baby girl not too long after Nola's sacrifice. After Royas conquered in Turkam, 
most of Intercam's aristocracy were hunted down and killed, but the Tagula family received plenty of partial treatment. Eldridge's attitude towards Nola had always been one of respect since it was her who sacrificed herself instead of him. Unfortunately, the Tegula family ended during the Age of Turbulence, while their descendants most likely still remained, the prestige and significance of their family name had already been lost. So that is Nola. Lan Shan lifted the curtains of their carriage to look at a large statue of Nola at the center of the city. The fact that they saw this girl almost immediately after entering the first city of the new Roya's kingdom made Lan Shan subconsciously ask. Indeed Negari chuckled and played with Yayu who was perched on his shoulder. He created the pure human that was Nola, and Nola also created the path for him to proceed on, but in the end, it was all in the past. The past could be remembered but didn't deserve any further attention. What he didn't expect was that Lan Shan still carried such a small emotion when she had already begun to manifest her pathway, perhaps, it was only expected of the embodiment of his emotions. I'm just a bit regretful that the one who served you in this world wasn't me, Lan Shan lowered the curtain back down and explained. I know Negari consoled her, then turned his gaze away from Lan Shan. Apparently looking through the walls of the horse carriage, he saw something and smiled, it seems our trip this time can't really be considered peaceful at all. Negari's return to the flame world was to merely use it as a springboard to enter Wang Yuan's world. He had no intentions of actually taking over this world since according to his analysis, this place was most likely an experimental site and one that the multitude's organization had borrowed more than once. Because of that, he had no intentions of infecting this world. He had three goals during his return to this world, to research more about it, to build a springboard that led to Wang Yuan's world, and to remember the past. And it was this part of Negari accompanying Lan Shan who was fulfilling his goal of reminiscing the past. Compared to Negari's relatively gigantic true self, this part of him wasn't particularly powerful. Of course, the fact that his nature as the phenomenon of progression had surfaced on this journey and chose to stimulate the advancement of the age of metal humans wasn't part of his goal. This was merely a hobby, or perhaps a part of research. Are you sure? Is that object truly here, within the city hall of this city at the border of the new Roya's kingdom, the city lord was hurriedly asking a man who wore tattered and dirty clothing. He originally had many choices among the cities he could rule, so why did he choose this border city? Of course, it was in hope of obtaining this exact piece of information. If this information was true, then the Ashius family would be able to skip at least a hundred years of struggles, which was much better compared to throwing themselves at those aristocratic widows. When the Age of Flames ended, it wasn't after 300 years of the Age of Turbulence that the new Age of Metal came to be. Supernatural power also started to recover during this period of time, which was also why Negari had believed that this was the experimental site of greater beings. It was simply unnatural for a world without its own spirit to somehow increase its supernatural quality in such a short time span. In this era, the first step to obtaining supernatural power was to use the bone forge art that was derived from respiratory art to vibrate one's bone, thus training the bone and giving it a metallic characteristic. After that, by using the blood created from this new bone, one would obtain a powerful body. This was only the first step, as one would then proceed to manifest a pugilist core through comprehension, enlightenment, rage, or other similar things. This process would improve the body in a qualitative manner, allowing it to absorb energy from the environment and thus obtain supernatural power. This made the importance of one's skeletal frame skyrocket, which was also part of one's bloodline inheritance. Since the skeleton was something everyone was born with, it was impossible to change naturally. Of course, that was only if one stuck to natural means. Bone swapping, a technique that was created at some unknown point by an unknown practitioner, 
but it had been confirmed beyond a doubt that if one found a high-quality bone, they would be able to use this technique to improve the natural density of one's bone. It was difficult to determine what would be considered the most powerful bones in this world, but if a ranking was made, the bones of giants would definitely make it to the top three. One of three gods from the first flame, the bones of a god, Dolan D. Ashia silently muttered to himself. His ancestor was an assassin of the Sacred Valley, which had been reconstructed before it was once again destroyed at the end of the Age of Flames, and the skeleton of the giant also broke and crumbled at that time. The mountain-like gigantic skeleton of the giant ended up with only a few fragments of skull bone remaining to produce water for the spring of life, while the rest had already turned into mud and rock of the mountain. Eventually, even the skull bone fragments were lost during the Age of Turbulence, becoming difficult to track down. Dolan Ashia's family had continued to hold on to this secret knowledge, never once giving up their search for the remains of the giant. And finally during this generation, when he had finally found information regarding something similar to the Spring of Life, how could it not excite Dolan? Chapter 466, Volume 7 Chapter 4 even dust has their moment of glory. Translator, La 09. Aside from Dolan who was silently excited, in a certain underground bunker of this border city, someone else was hysterical. Ahahaha, as long as I find that thing, I'll be able to complete this ritual. He was a young man wearing a set of what seemed to be worn but clearly well-maintained aristocratic clothing. During the Age of Flames, his ancestor used to be the sworn brother of a certain member of the Ghost Men. Since he lost the ability to leave descendants after becoming a Ghost Man, that Ghost Man had told all of his secrets to the family of his sworn brother. Including the ritual to become a Ghost Man. First drink the impure origin, then use the ceremonial blade to stab through one's heart, thus becoming a person who lingers on the verge of life and death. At this point, by implanting oneself with a secondary soul, one will become a ghost man that is comparable to a pugilist who has obtained their pugilist heart. Not only will one gain supernatural powers, but they will also obtain an immortal body. But following that personage's departure from this world, impure origin had gradually disappeared. Only by hunting the crow demons or death crows would one be able to obtain an inferior version. Furthermore, both the process of collecting and implanting a secondary soul would become significantly more dangerous without that personage's help, leaving plenty of side effects. Even so, even an incomplete ritual like this can result in the renowned ghost knight. The young man undid the leather sheath at his side to extract a glowing golden curved blade. The curved blade was slightly vibrating as if it had sensed something. It was also this vibration that allowed the young man to find it in a dark corner of his family's ancient storage room. And then there is also the spring of life. According to the ancestors' records, Dead Walker Jason was someone who replaced the impure origin with the spring of life's water and managed to kill the vice captain of the Ghost Men at the time, Codies. Under the circumstances where there wasn't any perfect impure origin, the spring of life's water would be the most perfect substitute. Observing the ceremonial blade in his hand, the young man thought about this family's rundown situation and made his determination to re-establish the family's glory no matter what. He just happened to learn of the location of the spring of life when he came out to sell his family's assets to another aristocrat in the city, coupled with his discovery of his ancestor's ceremonial blade the young man's ambitions had been thoroughly lit. I, Catho Jagus, will surely regain the glory of the Jagus family. The young man silently swore to himself, then heard the sound of the door to the underground room being opened, followed by the voice of a young child who was about seven to eight years old. Big brother, are you there? Ramilies, I'm here, I'll be there right away. Catho hurriedly hid the ceremonial blade and began to climb back up before he looked back at the wrapped ceremonial blade again. Although this thing could bring him immense power, 
it was still an artifact left by that personage. As everyone knows, that personage was also called by another name, the God of Omens. Any person who was related to him in any way would be immersed deeply within menace. The Cromans' bloodline was like this, the Dragonmen's bloodline was like this, and the inheritors of the Ghostmen ritual was no exception. Even the renowned Ghost Knight had a similarly notoriously tragic life story. Sitting in his horse carriage, Negri smiled full of interest as he observed all of this. He didn't try to use the world's curved aspect to observe their futures right away. This was because after Negri had achieved his pathway, even the mere act of observing two mortals' futures with his world-crossing vision could greatly influence the future to become the version he witnessed. For that reason, before he could develop a better method of observing the future, he would not arbitrarily do it. Of course, with the current information available to him, Negri could already see the most probable outcome. Lan Shan, let's remain in this city for a while Negri said. Lan Shan naturally obeyed him without question. The roads of the new royal's kingdom were quite decent, so Negri disembarked the horse carriage and travelled on foot with Lan Shan through its streets. Having not taken a stroll like this for a long while, he was now a bit more emotional towards it compared to before. Lan Shan, do you know why the majority of worlds within this multiverse contain humans? Negri's gaze continuously observed his surroundings. Reflecting the traces of how this city was formed, developed, and eventually ended up the way they were, in his eyes. Even a small piece of dust had its own past and history, perhaps it was once glorious, or simply an obscure nobody, there was plenty of information on them for anyone to observe and discern. I'm not very sure about that, but perhaps it's simply a common characteristic, Lan Shan had clearly wondered this before but hadn't found an answer, perhaps there was a law of the universe called humanity. No, no such thing exists. Of course, if you stretch the meaning, there could be Negri smiled and replied, humanity as a concept has not formed their own complete truth, they are merely the fragments created as the string of truth operates and moves against reality. Fragments. Indeed, just like this moat of dust. In any given room, the most numerous thing would not be humans, but rather, dust. And humanity is the dust of the multiverse. A sand realm is equivalent to a box that is thrown on the sidewalk, so it naturally collects a lot of dust, while greater realms are equivalent to cities. Although there was more dust here than anywhere else, they have never been the prominent figure or master. There are many sizes of dust, but in the end, they are still dust, and this is the same for humans. While there are clear differences between the humans of each world, their nature as dust doesn't change. This is the nature of humanity. A sand realm is too small for a normal person to go in, even if they manage to, they would feel restrained, which is why the species called humans manage to spread out across all the sand realms. Observing the humans on the street, Negri stated this cruel fact. Negri was currently in that exact restrained situation. The time flow of a sand realm couldn't affect him at all, so he had to carefully maintain a limit on his own power in order to remain normal here. This was also the reason why he wasn't observing the future, as the future of a sand realm really couldn't sustain his tinkering. The fact that he would only greatly increase the possibility of a certain future was already the result of Negri's extremely fine control. However, even dust has its own possibility. Negri turned his gaze to a small moat of dust and caught it with his finger, gently smiling, 526 years ago, this was once a part of the royal's empire's crown, and now it has fallen on my hand. That is the glory of dust. Indeed so. Meeting Lord Negri was also Yayu's glory Yayu who was still perched on Negri's shoulder immediately followed up. Negri lightly stroked the crow's head, then let go of the moat of dust on his finger and continued his stroll. After finding a good location, 
he gently scored the void with his finger to open up a subspace within another aspect of reality. This aspect seemed to be an exact replica of the normal world, but all humans here were statues who remained eternally in one place, up until the statue's corresponding person lost their life in reality. Meanwhile, the mote of dust that Negri caught with his finger earlier began to change, it started to give off an immense attraction that collected other pieces of dust around it, eventually turning into a seemingly regular ball of dust, continuing to be moved by its surroundings towards an unknown destination. Chapter 467, Volume 7 Chapter 5, Who Am I? Translator, La 09 The most crucial symbol of an individual's existence was the recognition of their own self. Only when an entity recognized its own self would it slowly be able to gain intelligence. As night slowly fell, the border city also gradually became silent. There are more compatriots on that side. The mass of dust bobbed up and down, the mote of dust at the very center together with the rest of the dust that was affected by the attracting force suddenly shifted. Apparently, the strange attractive force had sensed even more dust and became disturbed, so it quickly made a reaction. Following the reaction of the attractive force, the mass of dust's originally free form of movement was also altered. Increasingly more dust was being gathered by the mass of dust, it seemed that the more dust it gathered, the stronger the attractive force became, and the more information the mass of dust was able to collect. This mass of dust gradually became entangled with increasingly more dust, resulting in increasingly more reactions. Of course, these were only reactions, at least, they were up until the point when this mass of dust came into contact with a large piece of dust. The mass of dust slowly climbed onto this piece of dust that was even larger than itself, using the attractive force to search over the bigger piece's body until it eventually covered this piece of dust entirely. More information quickly flowed into the mass of dust and caused its attractive force to become more complicated. More and more information flowed from the larger piece of dust into the mass of dust, causing the attractive force that could only attract dust to be greatly strengthened and also formulate into a system, dictating the kind of reaction it should make towards certain inputs of information. As more of this information was concentrated, they also became intertwined and eventually formed the very first thought. Who am I? This huge mass of dust stood up, now appearing as an unfortunate person whose entire face was covered in dust. He appeared confused as he looked around his surroundings, more and more information began to flow into his core which formed more thoughts. Orome. Is this me? The dust slowly gathered and manifested into such a thought, but he quickly recognized that a name was merely a different way to call an individual. He continued to stand there, organizing increasingly more thoughts in his mind. The original small mote of dust had gathered and concentrated enough for its attractive force to eventually form a mass of informational energy, eventually ending up as a unique closed structure. Then, who exactly am I? The dust or Rome thought. A newborn soul. Negri turned his gaze away. The soul was a mass of informational energy created through the entanglement of an origin and the world's energy, with the origin being the source of universal truth. Having achieved a pathway, when Negri was doing research on origins, he had already recognized how to create a soul for a new life form. By stimulating a certain physical matter through truth, as the information contained with that truth became entangled with the world, a unique form of energy would be created. Following the inward flow of information from the surrounding world, the energy would eventually form thoughts and turn into a complete soul. However, Different physical matters would lead to different methods of receiving information, which determined the soul's thinking capabilities. The initial mote of dust was simply lucky that it received Negri's favor, then just happened to run into a dead body that hadn't died for very long, thus obtaining a large amount of information from that dead body. In the end, 
it gained an incomplete personality as well as a barely animated body together with all of its senses and a brain to serve as its core. That is also his fortune Yayu commented as it watched from the side. Although Yayu had learned about Negari's greatness through the information in its soul, knowing and seeing with its own eyes were two very different experiences. Evolving from a mote of dust to a basically normal living being in a short period of time, this abrupt change was quite shocking to any observer. Comparatively, it was similar to turning a mortal into a pathway entity. Of course, while the level difference was essentially the same, the difficulty involved was nowhere near the same. It is merely a test Negri didn't feel any bit of pride from his actions. Any pathway entity who had done even a little bit of research would be able to achieve the same. However, this process wasn't completely reliant on the string of truth's operational rules, as it cost the power of Negri's own truth. Meanwhile, at another location in this city, inside a certain manner, a massacre was occurring. Black-robed soldiers were mercilessly wielding their spears to reap the lives of their fellow humans. Dolan Ashius was currently sitting in a horse carriage just outside the manor with an indifferent gaze in his eyes, bringing no one but a few of his most trusted aides with him. The one who obtained the bone of God was an aristocratic collector who resided in this border city. They didn't know the exact background of this artifact, only that it was capable of creating holy water by putting it into freshwater.v. This holy water had very potent healing capabilities, which made it highly coveted for pugilists. This aristocratic family had managed to form many relations through this holy water, but because of how limited the production of holy water was as well as its obscure backgrounds, none of the other aristocrats found it necessary to break the tacit rules between aristocrats just to obtain it. However, this was only a tacit rule not because it couldn't be broken, but rather because it wouldn't be broken unless there was enough benefit involved. Dolan subconsciously touched the gemonate ring on his hand. This aristocratic family's current fortune was entirely thanks to the bone of God, that artifact had become their roots and the source of their success, so it would be impossible for them to hand it over in a trade. Furthermore, Dolan also didn't have so much resource that he would be able to trade for it in a normal manner, and silently stealing something of such significance was next to impossible, thus leaving the only choice remaining, an invitation to the afterlife. W.H. Why? In the manor, the head of the household was completely clueless about who would openly slaughter an aristocrat in the city like this. As a border city, the new Royer's military was naturally stationed all around the city. Their family also had its own forces, but they had already been suppressed one by one. Additionally, people who were capable of such a thing shouldn't have been able to enter the city undocumented as it was impossible for such a force to not be detected by the military who were stationed at crucial choke points around the city. As evidence of this fact, the force that invaded them was powerful but nowhere near enough to fight the military, so where did they get the courage to do such a thing? Go ahead and ask those questions in hell, a black-robed man wielded his knight sword and mercilessly swung down. The aristocrat's family head was unexpectedly able to see the insignia engraved on the sword's hilt, thus opening his eyes wide, you are. With a splash of blood, the head with a shocked expression rolled down to one side. The black-robed man glanced down at his own sword, noticing the exposed new warrior's military insignia engraved on it. Dolan did not mindlessly dedicate everything the Ashias family had to become the city lord of a border city just because of an obscure piece of news. The high treason crime of embezzling and selling off military assets required his coordination as the city lord, so it made sense for them to help him eliminate a few enemies, didn't it? Sir, everything has been cleaned out, the man in front of the carriage reported. Dolan wrapped himself inside a black robe as well and began to head into the manor under the other party's lead. There was blood and corpses everywhere in his sight. As he walked past the body of a young boy, 
his steps paused briefly before he continued forward. The tall black-robed man also emerged from the manor's main building, throwing a rag that was still soaked in blood to the side while unsheathing his sword. If one took a closer look, one would notice that there was a small mark on the rag that a group of bandits in this region used as their insignia. Never mind whether or not the bandits would be so dumb as to leave their insignia behind after causing a crime, or whether a group of bandits who could only steal from regular people would be able to cause such a massacre, wouldn't it be fine as long as a clue was left behind? I've done what you wanted. We haven't touched a single thing in the manor. First thing in the morning, I will be using the excuse of searching for the culprit to seal off access to the city, the rest will be up to you. The black-robed man paused as he walked past Dolan, then led his men out of the main building, guarding around the outside manor. Dolan slightly nodded and led his aides into the manor. They quickly found a secret room by following the traces of blood and reached a small fountain. At the bottom of the fountain floated a piece of what seemed like a kind of white mineral. This is it. This is exactly it. Dolan's eyes were full of excitement, he then immediately retrieved the small fragment from the fountain and swiftly took his leave from the manor. In the darkness, the young man Catho Juggers clenched the ceremonial blade in his hand tightly, not looking at the disappearing horse carriage nor trying to follow it. In fact, if he hadn't remained completely still and fully concealed his breathing, he would have already been discovered and killed by the expert combatants on the carriage. No matter what, I must regain the glory of the Juggers family. After everyone had left, Catho carefully infiltrated the manor and quickly found the small fountain, his gaze ignoring everything else. Chapter 468, Volume 7 Chapter 6, Magnificence and Glory Translator, La 009 At dawn the next day, the daytime servants who entered the Eskin Manor for their work immediately screamed out in horror, their voices resounding throughout the city. The public enforcers of the city quickly arrived at the scene and swiftly contacted the military stationed nearby. Because of how horrifying the scene of the crime was, this situation had already gotten far out of the city public enforcers' hands. Aristocrats had never been a bunch of helpless sheep waiting to be slaughtered, they had access to more resources in order to train more and better pugilists, and the Eskin family was quite the renowned aristocratic family in the city, so this level of massacre wasn't something they could deal with. The manor's food servers work on a rotational basis, even their chef gets changed every once in a while, and they had more than one water source, so it is impossible to poison all the people in such a large manner at the same time. H.M., there are many signs of struggle at the scene of the crime, but none of them extends very far, the culprit must be exceptionally strong. The two public enforcers exchanged glances, then both looked down. Everyone understood that the situation wasn't normal, and it was very simple to use the process of elimination to discern a group with this level of capabilities after a bit of serious investigation. However, anyone with a little bit of experience would recognize this to be a pawn disguised as a puddle. If they got involved, there was a possibility of being attacked and killed by thugs at any moment. Because of this, shortly after exchanging glances, the two of them proceeded with collecting evidence like they always did. However, they were being a lot more careless with it, ignoring a lot of points of suspicion. For example, the fact that the cut wounds were too clean to be done by regular weapons, or how the dead pugilists in the manor were clearly clinging onto some pieces of fine silk. The public enforcers took note of all of these details, but didn't say anything about it and instead began to faintly obscure them. Only sharp people would be able to make it into the public enforcers. Very quickly, the military temporarily put the city on lockdown with the excuse of searching for the culprits. Most of the citizens remained in their houses to be investigated, meanwhile, a small group of carriages silently left the city. It seems Ildridge hasn't fully recovered his strength standing on a tall position, 
Negri observed everything as they occurred, fully aware of what they were doing. Embezzling and selling military equipment or assets was a serious crime enough for capital punishment. If Aldrich still remained at his peak, the new Roya's kingdom would never become this way. However, in retrospect, Eldred's power originated from the authority of the last god, which originated from the first Age of Flames. At the end of the Age of Flames, the world's rules had already been changed, causing his power to backfire on him to a certain extent. Just surviving would have already been Eldred's great fortune, so he was most likely in a laying dead state. The extent of his power was only enough to help his subjects to rebuild the Roya's kingdom, but most likely not enough to actually take control of this country. Following that, Negri's gaze fell onto the worshipping altar in the center of the city, which worshipped the so-called divine Lord Ildridge. Most likely, following the changes in the world's natural laws, Eldridge was no longer able to obtain the support of his subjects through faith in the sovereign alone, so he changed the method and used religious faith. The chaos within the city quickly came to an end. The lockdown quickly came to an end after the military left the city. The culprit was also swiftly determined to be a group of bandits who infiltrated the city during the night and mercilessly slaughtered the entire Eskin family, the military announced their intentions of subjugating them all as soon as possible. However, the youngest son of the Eskin family, or Rome Eskin, had left the house the night before and fortunately managed to escape his death. Although he seemed to be shocked silly, the rules of aristocracy dictated that since he was the only remaining member of the Eskin family, he instantly inherited the Eskin peerage and became the new Baron Eskin. The city Lord Dolan had personally conducted the ceremony for him to inherit that peerage. You call that doing your work? Dolan angrily slammed his table and shouted. The plan he had drafted was supposed to be perfect, when Orome left the house for a party the night before, he was supposed to have been stabbed to death already, but he was somehow resurrected. It's no longer suitable to act on him, he won't be able to achieve anything on his own anyways, Dolan looked down at the man kneeling in front of his table and coldly said, as for you, since you couldn't fulfill your responsibilities, dismiss yourself and receive your punishment. You'll get another chance soon enough. Yes, sir, the man was still trembling as he retreated outside. At this point, a young boy carrying a wooden sword ran into the room, while he tried his best not to act arrogant, his small head couldn't help but perk up as if asking for praise, Lord Father, I managed to learn all twenty steps of swordplay today, aren't I great? You're awesome, my little parry, Dolan's cold expression vanished and picked up the young boy, quickly praising him. For some reason, he couldn't help but recall the dead body of the young Eskin family boy from the previous night. After a short lapse of attention, Dolan smiled and said, since little parry has tried so hard, father shall give you a present. In a few days, I'll perform another baptism for you you'll then be able to practice, bone forge art, and become a great pugilist, what do you say? Really, Lord Father, you're awesome, the young boy happily exclaimed and hugged his father lovingly. Ahaha, Dolan also laughed heartily and put the young boy's corpse out of his mind. For the sake of my family's glory, for my son, everything is worth it. At another location, Cathos' gaze fell onto the city lord's manor. As a decrepit aristocrat, he had already sold the majority of what could be sold in his house, leaving mostly only knowledge remaining. The ghost man ritual was already the last remaining chance for his jugger's family, so he would not let it slip. Those people left the city almost immediately after that massacre, and it would have been impossible for such a large group to flee the city in the middle of the night without the city lord's participation. Cather recalled the information he collected last night, coupled with the military's response today, he could already discern the true culprit of the Eskin family's massacre. There's definitely a dirty deal involved here, but that doesn't matter to me. All I need is the spring of life. 
he wasn't part of the public enforcers, so all he needed was suspicion, not clues. There was only a single spring of life, and there was only enough of the broken spring of life for a single person to use, so he must obtain that piece of bone of God no matter what. So I will need to employ some underhanded methods. The city lord's only son is also his biggest weakness. As long as I kidnap him and use him as leverage, I'll be able to ask for the whereabouts of the spring of life. But that boy definitely has pugilists protecting him at all times. Pugilists who had obtained a pugilist heart were people who wielded supernatural powers. Even though Catho hadn't relented on his training for a single day, his bone quality wasn't particularly great, so without extra resources, it was next to impossible for him to train his body to the limit and become a pugilist through traditional methods. Bone swapping required the gradual exchange of blood as well, so if resources couldn't keep up with the process, doing so would only leave side effects. For this reason, even though bone swapping wasn't a secret technique by any means, very few peasants could actually become pugilists. For peasants, there were only two main paths to becoming a pugilist, join the military, or become a dog of the aristocracy. Other than these two methods, other examples essentially couldn't be replicated. They either got extremely lucky and picked up some sort of treasure or were born with excellent bone quality that surpassed regular people. I need to draft a complete plan. Even after I obtain the spring of life, it mustn't have anything to do with the Juggis family at all. Catho gradually determined himself, for the glory of the Juggis family. Chapter 469 Volume 7 Chapter 7, Miserable World Translator, La 009 No matter what kind of status they have, everyone must go outside once every weekend. Catho stood outside the cathedral, closely observing this structure of worship for the god Eldridge. According to the constitutions of the New Royer's Kingdom, Every citizen of New Royers must come to the cathedral and pay their respects at least once during the weekend. Even someone with a physical handicap must carry a simple effigy of God with them and make simple prayers. Regardless of whether or not they honestly worshipped Eldridge, this was written as part of the New Royers Kingdom's law. Aristocrats were allowed to not go as often but they couldn't skip it entirely, otherwise, the local council would condemn them. If the infraction was severe, they could be stripped of their aristocratic status, if not, then a heavy fine would be issued until they had no choice but to go. There was a saying in the New Royer's Kingdom, there are only two things you cannot escape from in this country, dying at the end of your life, and praying to His Majesty Eldridge. Because of this, regardless of the situation, everyone would take some time out of their lives to head to the cathedral and pray. If people had a lot of free time, they might even go more than once, expressing just how much they loved and respected His Majesty, Eldridge. This was the case for even the aristocracy. It didn't matter how sincere they actually were with their faith, the least they must do was to show it publicly. While they were in the cathedral, it wouldn't be convenient for the pugilists to protect them, especially during their prayers. This would be the moment when they're the least cautious. Because no one would be so foolish as to attempt anything during the praying process, otherwise, the people of the cathedral would go berserk. Thinking of the people of the cathedral's expressions when he conducted this plan, Catho chuckled. Those people were part of the reason why the Juggis family fell to ruins. The aristocrats put a lot of emphasis on pride, so at some unknown point, a tacit rule had been established between the aristocrats and the church, which was that the offerings of the aristocrats when they visited the cathedral couldn't be too stingy. The amount wasn't exorbitant, even peasants would be able to provide that much, but the frequency of once per week was an issue. Considering all the spending that a failing aristocratic family had to shoulder to uphold their pride, Having to pay a periodic fee to the cathedral this way was also quite a bit of expenditure. What I need to do is to ensure that I don't face any pugilists directly. 
Catho was nearing insanity, but his insanity only made his mind even clearer. He understood very well that if he didn't take this risk, that Jugga's family was as good as done. Because of this, his insanity was the insanity of being ready to try anything and everything. Negari sat on top of the cathedral watching this little playground act play out. Having planned against an unsuspecting victim, the chances of Cathos' success was around 50 fiftieths. As if seeing something, Negari reached his hand into the void and pulled a butterfly into his hand. My lord, are you influencing their future? Wearing a long dress, Lan Shan sat next to Negari while leaning on him. She continued to hold a parasol over Negari's head to help shield him from the sun, even though a little bit of sun wouldn't affect the current Negari at all, Lan Shan insisted on doing it anyway. No, I'm merely making things a little bit more interesting Negari replied, according to the available information, a member of the church will be drawn by this butterfly and notice Catho's arrangements in three minutes, leading his entire gambit to fail. That would be much too boring. The difference between the two sides is simply too great, so the weaker side that is the boy deserves a chance Negari casually replied, but his true goal was only known to himself. Following Negari's advancement to a pathway entity, even a portion of him was difficult for Lan Shan and the rest to comprehend. In a location where nobody could possibly know about, boundless golden light was radiating. Something in the flame world seemed to be changing, which caused the world itself to change as well, obscuring certain pieces of information. This feeling of myself being history has its own charm. Negari was very aware of the other party's goal. The ghost man ritual and the ceremonial blade were both things that he left behind, but as time went by, these things had become myths and legends among the people, affecting them generation after generation. The butterfly that stopped in his hand once again flapped its wings and took flight. Its flight trajectory, in Negari's eyes, slowly became determined, as everything that was considered part of this butterfly was now grasped in Negari's hands. While wearing a pastor outfit, Catho slowly walked towards a certain place with a large trunk in his hand. Since the pastors with high enough standings were busy collecting their offerings, as long as they had enough confidence and caution, anyone could easily masquerade as a pastor. And most people would lower their guards against a pastor in a church. Without any bodyguards to stop him, Catho's plan was surprisingly successful. He managed to knock the city lord Dolan's son, Parry, unconscious and shoved him into a wooden trunk. As he pretended to be a pastor carrying offerings, by mostly hiding his face behind the trunk, some of the pastors who walked by didn't even suspect Catho. As long as he wasn't so unlucky that he ran into the manager who knew the faces of every pastor, it was impossible for him to be exposed. Once again, an older pastor in slightly luxurious clothing walked past and only gave him a short glance before continuing without noticing anything out of the ordinary. Catho easily carried the trunk away. Eventually, when Catho reached a relatively secluded area, he tossed the entire trunk into the underground saws. The opening to the saws wasn't very big, but the wooden trunk was just small enough to fit and Parry's curled-up figure fits snugly in the wooden trunk. After this, I just need to find an opportunity to go outside and find the other party in the opening of the saws, Catho muttered to himself and quickly returned to the cathedral, taking that opportunity to remove his pastor disguise and change back into an aristocrat who was barely getting by. Where is Parry? At another location, while Dolan was conversing with the head pastor, his gaze suddenly froze and looked at his surroundings, then had an ominous feeling. After excusing himself from the pastor, Dolan hurriedly went to search, but couldn't find his son anywhere. As his blood started to freeze in his veins, he tried his best to maintain composure and hurriedly went to the head pastor to explain his situation. Although the cathedral's position was considerable, they didn't have the courage to offend the lord of a city, 
so they mobilized all the pastors to search while also temporarily sealing off the cathedral's main gates. As he watched the cathedral's main gates closing up, Catho's expression remained unchanged. Even if he was a ruined aristocrat, he was still an aristocrat, which made it impossible for them to conduct a personal search, unless they wanted to offend the aristocracy as a whole. This was part of aristocratic pride and rules. However, as he thought of something, his eyes slightly changed. He was fine, but what about Parry? Being shoved into a trunk and left to float inside dirty water like that might be fine for a short while, but there was no telling what would happen after a long time. Watching Dolan's anxious expression, Catho thought about this, then slowly closed his eyes and became calm again. It wasn't until twilight that the search ended without results and Catho was released together with the rest of the cathedral visitors. He constantly complained as he exited the cathedral, acting the same way that a minor aristocrat would act whenever they were involved in an incident. After escaping all observing eyes and confirming his own safety, Catho headed straight towards the source. After searching for a bit with a torch, Catho finally found the small wooden trunk in a certain part of the underground source. The trunk was very quiet. When Catho opened and illuminated the inside with the beating fire, he saw nothing but a cold dead corpse of a child, perhaps due to lack of oxygen, his skin was also a bit bruised. You have no one to blame but yourself, City Lord Dolan, you were the one who kept me there, Catho closed his eyes and lightly murmured then closed the trunk back up. Even if the hostage was already dead, he would still achieve his goal. Chapter 470, Volume 7 Chapter 8, Megary's Human Aspect Translator, La 009 Big brother, big sister, where am I? Parry confusedly asked. Earlier, he was still talking to a pastor, since his father had taught that he should maintain an amicable relationship with the white-robed men, when he suddenly felt a sharp pain on his neck and fell unconscious. When he woke back up, he suddenly saw these two entities who had inhumane beauty. That was to say, beauty still had its value. If the one who appeared in front of Parry was an ugly mug who looked like a villain, then Parry would now be trying to run while screaming for help but since the one he faced was Negary, all of his guards had been lowered. You are already dead. We saved you. You should now let go of your previous identity Negary curtly made three statements and arranged everything. This Negary was the portion that Lan Shan, his embodiment of emotions, had been able to observe and comprehend, the crystallization of Negary's humanity, which took up one ten thousand of Negary as a whole. He was one of Negari's ten thousand aspects, the human aspect. That was to say, this Negari was the part of Negari that was easiest to talk to, the friendliest to humans, and the one that loved them the most. Of course, that didn't mean that Negari's human aspect would suddenly be partial to humans to the point of being their saint mother, his adhesion to Negari's rule of granting everyone an opportunity had simply been greatly magnified. This negary would provide appropriate aid to the innocent and those with potential, allowing them to mature more easily. Of course, there was still a price to pay, but it was much more lenient. For example, Parry wasn't considered innocent. He was Dolan's son and was raised with Dolan's resources, although he hadn't actively harmed anyone, his correlation to their deaths couldn't be disregarded. After saving him, Negari created a fake body to replace him, turning him into a normal person who has nothing to do with the Ashias family from this point onwards. Do your best. By the time you're capable enough to see me again, I will help you remember everything after saying that, Negari's palm covered Parry's vision. Before the young boy could understand what was happening, he fell unconscious once again. After this, his appearance would be changed, he would forget both his name and background, having nothing left but his knowledge up to this point. Standing next to him, Lan Shan giggled a bit with her eyes slightly narrowed. 
If it had been the original Megari, Parry would have forgotten everything, having to rely on his instincts to grow stronger. If he couldn't achieve this, he would remain a normal person for the rest of his life, and the most he would receive was an emotionless piece of information. But the human aspect had instead left this piece of memory, ensuring that Parry would not be confused when he woke up again. At another location, Catho was prepared to act as if Parry was still alive and used him as a hostage to demand a ransom from Dolan, asking for the Spring of Life. No matter who took the Spring of Life, the city Lord Dolan would have been involved in that matter, so it was the best choice to demand it from him as the only lead Catho had. Regardless of who actually possessed the Spring of Life, as long as the city lord wanted to preserve his son's life, then he would have to hand over the Spring of Life. The only danger Catho had to face right now was how to safely retrieve the item he demanded while not being suspected at all, especially when the hostage was already dead. During this process, if his identity was revealed at any point, he would have to bear the full brunt of the city lord and the cathedral's berserk vengeance, considering how much their reputation had been tarnished by letting the city lord's son be kidnapped while they were at the cathedral. Even now, the pastors were still visiting houses one after another to investigate this matter, showing that they were panicking even more compared to losing their own children. However, no matter how tough it was, for the sake of the Juggis family's glory, Catho had no choice but to gamble it all. Big brother, what have you been doing recently? I haven't seen you around at all, Ramelis peeked his head up, trying to help Catho move the trunk, only to hear the most severe scolding he had ever received in his life. Put it down, do not touch it. Catho quickly took back the trunk with a strict expression, but as he realized that he had scared his brother, he slowly calmed down and said, it'll just be a bit slower. Ramelis, your only duty right now is to train yourself and study as much as you can, just leave these things to your big brother, okay? After saying that, Catho started pulling the trunk down into the underground chamber. No matter what happened, he intended on bearing the sins alone and leaving his younger brother out of this entire matter. Observing the ceremonial blade that remained on his hip, Catho understood that there was still a lot of preparations left to do. Time quickly went by, and for the next few days, numerous people had walked across the little beggar without realizing that he was the city lord's son, including himself. Looking at the poster that was put all over the streets, Parry felt nothing but envy. That kid's family members were worried sick for his absence, but he couldn't even remember his past. Of course, he also had the wishful thought that he was actually the young boy in the poster. But I'm completely different from the boy in the poster. He has blonde hair, while I have nothing but the most common brown-colored curly hair. Suppressing his unrealistic wishful thoughts, Parry rang the bell on the door of the Eskin Manor. After being revived with this inexplicable information in his mind, Parry had closely observed his surroundings in an attempt to grow stronger, but the prerequisite for growing stronger was to first survive. He had no status or identity, so he needed work. The bronze bell rang from the other side of the door. After waiting for a bit, when Parry was about to get on his tiptoes and ring the doorbell again, he saw an expressionless man opening the door with a book in his hand. What's the matter, little boy? Orom's gaze briefly left his book and turned towards the one who rang his bell. Initially, he didn't even know that the bell ringing meant that someone was at the door. It wasn't until the city's public enforcers thought that he had fallen victim to another attack and forced their way inside that he understood a ringing bell meant someone was looking for him. Greetings, Sir Baron, I want to find a job. I've been observing for a while and saw that your manor doesn't have any servants or managers. I just happen to know a lot about these matters. Parry had been living in a similar manner for his entire life. Thanks to his excellent upbringing, his observational skills were quite decent, so he had relatively detailed knowledge in many things, and even if he had forgotten who he was, 
he had managed to retain this knowledge. No, you are too young. Furthermore, many people have already been killed in this manner. This is a cursed place, you should just leave, after giving his reply, or Rome started heading back into the manor. All the daytime workers who were previously employed here had asked to quit just a few days ago, saying that the manor was cursed. Of course, the majority of them knew very well what had happened, but they simply didn't want to get involved with trouble. After the end of the Age of Flames, the so-called evil spirits of the past have ceased to appear. Even the witches of the past have mostly gone extinct, so a curse is nothing but nonsense, Parry had a lot of relative knowledge. He knew about these obscure pieces of trivia, but he had no idea about the wickedness and schemes that the human mind could conjure up. Are you very knowledgeable about these things? Or Rome halted his steps and asked. Even though he had learned a lot of information through this human body and gradually gotten accustomed to human customs and etiquette, he was still mostly clueless about the numerous formalities of the human race. The only thing that could touch his mind right now was knowledge. I can remember that someone had taught me this, but I don't remember who, I don't even remember who I am, Parry smiled bitterly. So you do not know for sure who you are either. Or Rome suddenly understood what the emotion of sympathy meant, so he turned around again and opened the gates of the manor, come inside first. Thank you, Sir Baron. No, just call me Or Rome, Or Rome didn't really understand what kind of qualitative changes there would be for such diverse forms of address. He had simply looked up the meaning of his current name, he who loves learning, so he preferred that others called him Or Rome. Chapter 471, Volume 7 Chapter 9, Confrontation Translator, La 009 Sir, this was delivered by a beggar, he didn't even see who was the one that sent this message. I know, you're dismissed, Dolan was exceptionally regretful about not keeping a close eye on Parry. As he read the ransom paper, he was seething with rage. He had to spend all that effort collaborating with the military through their wicked deeds in order to retrieve the bone of God from the Eskin family, but now the other party was asking him to just hand it over. His rage couldn't be described by words alone. Their search had eventually discovered that the culprit carried his son off using the cathedral saws, but it was already too late when they tried to search for the boy, and they still had no idea who the culprit was. Those damn pastors, I can't believe there was such a huge opening in the cathedral. Dolan just wanted to shout into those pastors' faces right now. Not only did they open a sewage system in their backyard without consultations, but they also didn't even station anyone to watch it. Furthermore, the pastors' mouths weren't very tight. The investigation later found that the information about there being someone near the source was first casually mentioned by a pastor responsible for garbage disposal. There were simply too many people who knew about this for it to be a useful clue for screening members. The arrogance of those people had already reached their core. The ransom letter demanded him to hand over the artifact that produced the spring of life, otherwise, they would kill Parry Ashius. As for how the trade would be conducted, they would go into details in another letter to be sent three days later, and that he had better get the trade item ready within those three days. Master, that Orome hasn't left his manor for the past few days. Someone naturally suspected the survivor of the massacre, but since Orome was focused on nothing but knowledge, he hadn't left his manor at all for the past few days, putting him out of suspicion. Is this karma? The corpse of the small boy in the Eskin Manor flashed before Dolan's eyes once again. He was now in extreme panic, he was scared that his little parry would also end up as a corpse in a place like that as well. Send someone to tail that beggar closely. And also, station our eyes in every possible location, we need to find the culprit, thinking of another possibility, Dolan's expression became ferocious and continued continue monitoring the Eskin Manor, find an opportunity to get rid of that remnant. Understood, 
the butler accepted his orders and dismissed himself. What does this word mean? Orome asked Parry who was eating right next to him. The original owner of this body didn't have a particular liking to knowledge, otherwise, he wouldn't have gone out of his house in the middle of the night to meet with a married woman. The amount of knowledge that the dust inherited wasn't a lot, so even after reading the same book for a long while, he still had a lot of things he didn't clearly understand. On the other hand, while Parry was still young, Dolan had expected a lot of him and hired many tutors for him ever since he was young. Although Parry's bone talents weren't particularly great, he was a genius when it came to academic matters, as well as being highly perceptive. This was the reason why Dolan loved him so much. Let me take a look. This word is from the Korchi language, it's pronounced enigawai. It means another self within oneself, this other self is a more powerful and unrestrained version of oneself. Although, in an earlier era, it used to refer to the god of omens and diseases, Parry swallowed his food and looked at the word in the book, swiftly explaining it. For some reason, a certain piece of memory resurfaced in his mind. So I can only find my past self if I'm capable enough to find that person again. Enigawa, or Rome softly muttered this word and also felt a strange sensation in his mind, it was as if he had just received some information from the name itself, a more powerful self. Yeah, the Korchi people believed that there was a god called Negari who existed in everyone's body like how everyone would eventually get sick. Get sick. Orome felt a bit puzzled, why is a stronger self equal to getting sick? I don't know either. The teacher who taught me before only explained that many people thought about it that way, in the end, Parry was still just a ten-odd-year-old young boy, he had learned a lot of things, but he wasn't very clear about more complicated subjects. At the time, the will of Negari was the strengthening of oneself through any method, regardless of means and unrestrained by the rules of society apparently noticing their conversation, Negari smiled and explained, the ideal was still in its infancy at the time. This kind of ideal would naturally be considered a kind of sickness by those in power, especially a feudal society that hopes to keep its populace dumb and clueless Negari commented. It was necessary for Negari's will to be at an infant level at the time, a weaker individual could only improve themselves through this manner, while a stronger individual would have better methods to achieve the same results. Then what about now, hearing Negari telling her about his past, Lan Shan felt exceptionally delighted. After all, there was nothing more intimate than your most important person being willing to share their past with you. I am the rules Negari gently replied. Dolan, your request is over the line, the black-robed man coldly said to Dolan, I've already accomplished your previous request, you losing your child is your own problem. I understand that, Bastin Fay, I understand, Dolan lightly nodded. While these words were very polite, the forcefulness within it could clearly be heard by anyone, my parry is my everything. He is the motivation for my struggles, as well as the biggest reason why I had taken the risk to collaborate with you people. If he isn't here anymore, nothing good would come out of this collaboration for both of us. I will send my men to help you, the black-robed man called Bastin Fay glared at Dolan for a while before standing up to leave the city lord's manor, but only this once. You must understand, the city lord doesn't necessarily have to be you. Watching as Bastin Fay left his office, Dolan slightly sighed. If necessary, he didn't want to have to meet that guy face to face. Dolan found his inhuman sense of pressure incredibly uncomfortable, but to ensure that nothing went wrong, the only one Dolan could rely on was him. Dolan sighed heavily. He understood that it definitely wasn't a good thing to collaborate with such a person but for the glory and continuation of the Ashias family, he had no other choice. Time continued to pass day by day, the three-day time limit had caused Dolan to feel nothing but anxiety, this was the first time Parry had been away from him for so long, 
living in an unknown environment not under his control. The bone swap ritual has already been prepared, Parry, as soon as you return, you'll be able to practice, bone forge art, and become a great pugilist, so you have to return safely, Dolan continuously prayed to the great Emperor Eldridge, praying that he could allow Parry to return. Sir, a message has arrived. The report caused Dolan to stop his prayers. Once again, he saw the same kind of paper and envelope, which the butler had already opened and was reading for him. They told us to leave the object in a certain part of the source. If they notice anyone around or that the object is fake, they threaten to break off the deal and kill the young master at any moment. Who delivered it? Dolan asked. A blind person from the slums. The other party had given the letter to him and instructed him exactly what to do, we couldn't see how they did it. I understand, prepare the object. The letter had purposely used the word they, so it was very possible for the culprit to have an accomplice, with one side killing the hostage if the other was captured. This made it so that Dolan couldn't take a risk and had no choice but to properly prepare what they demanded, but if those damned kidnappers believed that they could simply escape after obtaining the item, then they were too naive. Chapter 472, Volume 7 Chapter 10, Corpse Victory Translator, La 009 The letter had specifically pointed out that the one to deliver the demanded item must be a non-pugilist, and that after the item was left there, they were forbidden from approaching it for one hour. After this period, Parry would naturally be released, considering they didn't want to cause the city lord to go completely berserk. However, as the delivery person reached the first address, they found nothing but a letter that directed them to another location in the sores, telling them to bring the item there within half an hour. Shifting the delivery location to tire out the person tasked with delivery, these thieves sure are slight, Bastin Fay was currently dressed in a black robe. As an upper brass of the military, it wasn't a particularly good thing for him to be personally acquainted with the city lord or a border town, let alone having a good relationship with them. Only by separating the military from the cities would the royal family and the church feel assured. For that reason, it wasn't convenient for Bastin Fay to publicly wear his military uniform during this operation. However, this thief's understanding of top-level pugilists is too shallow. Even at this distance, I will still be able to detect and lock onto an individual's life signatures. As long as that thief tries to retrieve the item, they will not be able to escape my pursuit. I'll trouble you during this matter. Mr. Bastin Fay, please ensure the safety of my son, Dolan was very timid during their conversation. He only managed to convince the other party to help this time around by threatening him with their relationship. Bastin Fay curtly glanced at Dolan without saying anything else. Being threatened wasn't the only reason he had agreed to help Dolan, but rather because those who had a clear weakness like him were also those easiest to control. As long as he held Dolan's weakness in his hand, it would be beneficial to his plans later on. The delivery person had to travel to several more locations, each of which contained only a single letter directing them to the next location. This level of patience drew Bastin Fay's interest in these thieves. The one who came up with this was quite the talented individual, so if he could hold back during his pursuit he would leave that person alive and see whether or not they could be used for his benefit. H.M. So this is the final location huh, the delivery person seemed to have discovered something at the last location, as their life signs fluctuated ever so slightly. A few moments later, the delivery person left that location and returned straight to them. There weren't any approaching living beings, Bastin Fay maintained his surveillance on that location while asking the delivery person, your life signs changed slightly while you were in there, did something happen? The newest letter told me to put the item there, but I found a newly deceased body in the vicinity, the delivery person hurriedly explained, I've already stabbed a dagger through the head to confirm that it was a real dead body. 
But very strangely, the other party's face seemed to have been mutilated by something, I couldn't discern their appearance at all. Hearing that, Bastin Fay's expression changed and hurriedly ran towards that location. His body was bulky and muscular, but he leapt on the rooftops as lightly as a feather. From a distance, without already knowing where he was and keeping a close eye on him, no one would be able to tell that he was approaching them. In the saws, the dead body with the mutilated face suddenly stood back up. Even though there was a deep and long gash on his face, that didn't impede him at all. Simply being stabbed in the heart by the ceremonial blade would only turn people into reanimated corpses. The difference between these people and the ghost men was the fact that without impure origin or the spring of life to support them, their bodies would gradually decay until there was nothing left of them except bones. Catho knew very well that he couldn't possibly resist a powerful pugilist, so he had already conducted the ritual ahead of time to turn himself into a rotting reanimated corpse. He used the constantly changing locations to wear down the other party's patients while also ensuring that they couldn't arrange for people to block out all of his exits, then disguised himself as a dead body not too far away from the delivery location. As a reanimated corpse, other than the fact that he could move, he was literally no different from a corpse. After picking up the bone of God, without examining it at all, Catho swiftly ran through the saws and jumped into the dirty water. As a corpse, he had no problem with this little bit of filth. While fleeing, he also plunged the piece of bone into his heart, which caused his blood that had clotted up to also become fluid again. This made Catho very glad, as he didn't have a way to confirm whether or not the other party had given him the real article. The only thing he could do was gamble that the city lord would be wary of his non-existent accomplice, as well as the fact that he valued his son highly enough. And now, everything seemed to have paid off. As long as he could escape pursuit right now, he would have already succeeded with his plan, he could always choose a secondary soul later on. Of course, there was also the problem of the aftermath. For example, how to heal his face so that he still looked like a normal person, but this shouldn't be an issue after he obtained the spring of life. The ritual hadn't been conducted for very long, so his body hadn't completely rotted away, and with the spring of life's help, the damage done up to now could be healed. Bastin Fay quickly landed into the saw water and paused. He was examining the surrounding movements, then swiftly leapt forward in the direction Catho was fleeing. It was quite interesting for the other party to be able to play around with him like this. Although he could only utilize the abilities of a pugilist for now, being able to achieve this in the first place was already extraordinary. Sitting on top of a building, Negri's gaze somewhat changed as if he had seen something interesting. His previous expression of enjoyment also turned to seriousness, as something unexpected seemed to have found itself into the script Negri had written. While Bastin Fay was quickly giving chase, a loose brick from the wall of the saws fell out, seemingly due to a slight tremor. The brick fell onto a certain poisonous bug that just happened to be crawling by, squeezing just enough poison from its innards through its mouth to form a jet of poison that shot towards him as he ran past, accurately targeting his eyes. Even a first-rate pugilist was only human, so if poison had directly shot into his eyes without any protection, it was possible for him to be blinded. Bastin Fay immediately closed his eyes, causing the poison to be blown away by a force that exuded from inside his body. His expression then turned serious. That poison jet had attacked him just as the forces in his body reached the peak of circulation, if it had attacked just a second earlier or later, he would have had a better way to deal with it, but right at that moment, it took a lot of force just for him to blink. This definitely wasn't a coincidence, but somebody actually helped that kidnapper. However, would someone with such capabilities be interested in a piece of bone without much source energy left in it? So this is your game, huh? The military man stopped his advance and observed this seemingly mundane saw tunnel. 
he could almost confirm that if he continued this pursuit, more coincidences would occur. That was why he stopped, because nothing would have come out of this even if he continued his pursuit. Because my strength had already exceeded the limits of this game. Bastin Fay muttered, then I hope that you won't interfere with my plan as well, otherwise, we'll have no choice but to match blows. What's the matter? Lan Shan slightly opened her eyes and asked. Negari had been relatively relaxed throughout this entire journey, and this was the first time that he had shown such a serious expression. It's a clone of some other entity Negari opened his eyes and replied, apparently, they didn't bring their own powers, relying only on this world's native power system, so I can't accurately discern their true capabilities. At this point, Lan Shan sensed a change in Negari's human aspect, some information was rapidly flowing back and forth, causing even more changes to occur. Chapter 473, Volume 7 Chapter 11, Corpse Defeat Translator, La 09 What's the situation, when Dolan saw Bastin Fay returning empty-handed, he immediately felt uneasy. Even though nothing was as important as his son, that bone was still something that he spent untold amounts of effort in order to obtain, so he wasn't willing to simply lose it. The thieves have backing, they are at least the level of first-rate pugilists, I can't easily help you in this matter, Bastin Fay told him straight, just consider yourself unlucky this time. After that, Bastin Fay simply left without any further explanations. Originally, it was because Dolan had threatened him with their relationship, and he also wanted more leverage to take control of Dolan that he begrudgingly agreed to help. Now that an unknown entity has gotten involved, this matter can only be left aside. As for Dolan, other than considering himself unlucky, there was literally nothing else he could do. He didn't even have the ability to scold Bastin Fay, as he was the weaker side in their relationship. The other party helping him just once was already a show of their sincerity, any further forceful demands would only result in terrible consequences that he didn't want. Dolan's expression wasn't great, but he just heaved a long sigh. Regardless of what happened, everything was fine as long as his little parry returned to him, things like talent and potential can be considered later on, even if all the resources and effort he spent earlier on the bone had gone to waste. Catho opened the door to the underground secret room and touched his face. He could feel the buds of flesh moving on his skin, his blood that was now filled with vitality once again circulated throughout his entire body, making it seem like he was no longer a dead person. He fell to his knees and covered his mouth, madly grinning trying to hold back his laughter. His facial expression was horribly distorted. I've done it. I managed to obtain the spring of life from them and become a pseudo-ghost man. After this, I only need to find a suitable secondary soul and I'll become a true ghost man, directly wielding supernatural powers. During the Age of Metal, even though the foundational technique for supernatural powers had become commonplace, there are still very few who could actually wield them. A pugilist who wielded supernatural powers would receive partial treatment and privileges equivalent to an aristocrat no matter where they were, although this treatment wasn't hereditary and they wouldn't be granted any land. Most people can only reach the level of training their bodies, they don't have the resources to change out their blood, so even though many people were practicing bone forge art, very few of them could advance any further. After his hysterical fit of laughter was over, Catho wiped the tears from his eyes and turned towards the trunk in the corner. Some traces of limestone powder could be seen around the edges, together with a faint rancid smell. Catho stood up and opened the door of the secret room, picking up the trunk, he thought briefly before putting a letter on it. The city lord is coming. What now? City lord, sir. The commotion around him caused Dolan to feel a bit detached from reality. When his butler ran in to report the news, he could already guess by the look on his face. But even now, he couldn't comprehend that this was the truth, 
it was as if everything had become unreal. He was clearly still showing off his achievements to me just a few days ago, so why did it turn out like this? The group silently parted ways for Dolan to see the small trunk in front of him. A purplish bruised small face drained of any blood was silently lying within a mass of limestone powder. Dolan's legs lost all of their strength, he fell on his knees, practically screaming out loud, that can't be my son, my little parry still isn't dead, he can't be dead. How could he be dead? Dolan was completely broken, no longer paying attention to his pride or dignity as the city lord or an aristocrat. Even though he was denying that this dead body was his son with all his might, Dolan couldn't help but slowly crawl in front of the wooden trunk. As he pulled the small boy's body out of the trunk, his rationality rapidly plummeted, repeating over and over to himself that this couldn't be true. His motivation, his faith, the very pillar for his life up to his point had completely collapsed, he was only a hair's breadth away from going insane. In the room above, Bastin Fay frowned. Dolan as a person had already been completely broken, so his plan would have to be changed as well. Dolan didn't know when he returned to the city lord's manor, nor who brought him back, but the small boy's dead body had remained in his embrace this entire time. It wasn't until that night that Dolan regained his senses. His expression was exceptionally calm, or rather, terrifying calm. He could clearly feel himself calmer than ever before. He had already read the letter in the wooden trunk as well, which explained in simple words that they were sorry and that Parry had already suffocated to death when he was being carried away by the sewage water. So this is karma. Dolan once again recalled the small child's body in the Eskin manor. For the sake of his goal, he had massacred everyone in the Eskin family leaving only Orome remaining who somehow survived. But the only thing he got out of it was the terrible death of his own son as well. If this was karma, then let's have things become even more insane, Dolan stood back up. His body was already ruined from the years of toil, he could no longer have a second son, so the Ashius family was already done for, he had no other heir. I might as well lose everything else as well, Dolan turned to the butler and said, the calm but desperate look in his eyes caused the butler to tremble. Order the men around the Eskin Manor to do it, my son is dead but he's still alive, that simply isn't right. Dolan stood up and lightly stroked the dead boy's head in an incredibly gentle manner. Even the tone of his voice was the same, giving off a terrifying sense of gentleness. Understood. Sir, the butler hurriedly responded while also sighing in relief. Turning his rage to an underserved party was a normal reaction at times like this, so as long as he has relieved his rage, Lord Dolan should return to normal. However, Dolan's next statement caused the butler to freeze up completely, furthermore, little Parry liked to make merry, we should send a few more people down with him. He continued to keep the body in his embrace and walked to the highest floor of the city lord manor to look down towards this border town. In his vision, he could see numerous people walking through the streets, some of which were little children playing with one another. Dolan turned to the butler and said, My son is already dead, so why do they get to live? Am I my lord? The butler was trembling. Order some men to do it. There are always reckless idiots willing to risk their lives for money, let alone something of this level. Weren't those thieves also the same? The Ashius family is already done for. Understood, my lord, the butler trembled as he dismissed himself. He didn't know what the city lord would do if he had refused, so he didn't have the courage to refuse. There are always reckless people who want to become pugilists and would not stop at anything to earn resources for this goal. It wasn't difficult to massacre a bunch of children, as long as they remain wary of any revenge that comes afterwards. They're already used to it, just change their identity after getting these resources and flee to another city, they would still be able to live perfectly well. And for border cities like these, 
such dark people were a dime a dozen. Negri and Lanshan were both standing behind Dolin, but the other party couldn't see them at all. He also had no strong emotions towards this citywide massacre one way or another. There had always been people who die in this city every day, no one would obtain any salvation, as the only one who could save them had always been themselves. Chapter 474, Volume 7 Chapter 12, One Without Anything Translator, La 09 The massacre swiftly went into motion. Those desperate for money in the city were more than willing to bring in the heads of children in exchange for bounty, especially when it was so much easier compared to bringing in other kinds of heads. However, these people didn't notice that this massacre was very different from before. A portion of children managed to escape from the hands of these desperate fellows, while others who lost their lives were unable to close their eyes no matter what, it was as if something was incubating in those eyes. Additionally, such a large commotion couldn't possibly deceive other people, and after confirming the situation, the cathedral had issued an announcement to eliminate city lord Dolan, who had fallen to wickedness due to the distraught of losing his son's life. The other aristocrats in the city had also joined forces and sent out a coordinated group to attack the city lord manor. By the time they arrived, the corpses of over ten children had already been gathered. Dolan was standing there with his son's corpse in his embrace. There were other corpses all around him as well, looking at their clothes, they were most likely some greedy people. The majority of the city Lord Manor's people had already fled, those who managed to seize their time and finish their job had also fled as soon as they got their money, only those whose greed clouded their eyes were on the ground. While Dolan was already insane, his strength hadn't gotten any weaker. Instead, he seemed to have gotten even stronger. If he wasn't already prepared to die, or if the state of his body was a bit better, he might be able to break through his current level as a pugilist to obtain supernatural powers and gain a qualitative change. Ah, you sure arrived quickly. If only you had found my son this quickly as well, none of this would have happened, Dolan smiled while gently patting the corpse in his embrace seemingly easing his own suffering. This and that are two different matters, you've fallen, Dolan, the bishop of the cathedral's expression couldn't be described as anything other than horrible. In the end, the cathedral was partly responsible for this as well, considering Dolan's son was kidnapped while they were in the cathedral. For that reason, what he wanted to do right now was to quickly pronounce Dolan as sinful, after which they could easily consider everything as Dolan receiving what he just deserved. Were you responsible for the Eskin massacre, Dolan? The bishop loudly questioned. He even imbued his voice with the cathedral's own unique mental forging technique, which allowed his will to affect the mind of weaker people. No one was actually stupid, but when certain things being uncovered wouldn't provide them any benefit, and would also offend the city lord, there was literally no reason for them to say it. However, when they needed an excuse at times like this, even if that event wasn't orchestrated by Dolan, they would still force that responsibility on him. You can say whatever you want, Dolan knows that even if he refuses to admit it with all his being, these people will still consider him to have confessed. He no longer has the mind to argue against these matters, everything is already over for him anyway. If nothing unexpected occurred, Dolan would simply stand here until death with the corpse in his embrace, the cathedral and aristocrats would secretly feed all the non-existent evidence of his crime to him, casually taking this chance to wipe their own asses. This was already something they were used to. Most likely, not too long from now, various truths would come to light that point to Dolan being the culprit. Of course, he wasn't actually innocent either. For that reason, Negri wasn't willing to see something like that play out and walked next to Dolan whose heart was already dead. Dolan's eyes became dilated as he finally managed to observe Negri, but the others didn't notice Negri at all and were still ferociously questioning Dolan's crimes. However, Dolan didn't care about him either. 
because he had already lost everything, Dolan's current state of mind was that of a watcher. He had indeed committed a crime, and if his son had died for the crimes he committed, then he had simply committed an even greater crime than he had thought, but now at least no one else will need to suffer again, as everything was already over for him. Did you think it was all over? Negri lightly asked but didn't receive any reaction from Dolan. He didn't care what this person who showed up out of nowhere wanted, he now simply wanted to join his son in death. When Parry was about to die, I was at the scene but Negri's next words immediately got a reaction from Dolan. It wasn't that Dolan didn't want revenge, he simply didn't have the capabilities to do so. Even Bastin Fay had confirmed that the other party had a first-rate pugilist backing him, which means they were an entity that he was powerless again. He didn't even know who the culprit was, he only knew that everything was already over. Coupled with the Eskin massacre from earlier, he felt that his actions had gotten Parry unnecessarily involved, so he wanted nothing more than to join his son in death. But when the culprit had already stood in front of him, Dolan would not hesitate to attack them no matter what, even if the only thing he could do was take a bite out of them. And so, under the pastors, bishop, and aristocratic troops' confused gazes, Dolan abruptly went crazy and began to attack the empty land next to him. That's why I had allowed him to continue living, care to guess where your son is now? Negri didn't care about Dolan's attacks and simply continued to speak although that didn't stop Dolan from continuing to try and attack. However, the more Dolan attacked, the slower Negri talked, the human body is carbon-based, so it's exceptionally simple to create a soulless body. Where is he? Finally, Dolan managed to comprehend what he was hearing. He felt like his head was spinning, being pulled back from a watcher's perspective to reality caused him to feel a bit disoriented, but still loudly asked, tell Emmy. Where is my son? Hurry up and tell me. You've given your subordinate quite a terrible order, getting innocent people involved Negri's tone contained a quality that made sure others had to believe him, you should know as well, several days earlier, the Eskin Manor had just hired a relatively young new butler to help Oro manage his estate. Your subordinate is currently acting on your orders. He seems to be preparing to loot the Eskin family's fortune after completing the deed, as you should know, that subordinate of yours want a bit of money for the road. And so, what comes next will depend on how well you perform. Perhaps you might even be able to see him one last time if you just run fast enough Negri's figure slowly faded away, but the scene of how Negri altered Parry's appearance manifested in his mind. No, no. What have I done? Dolan became completely insane. By the time he looked back at the corpse in his hand, he could now clearly see that the corpse in his hand was actually a living, hovering butterfly. Letting go of what was in his embrace, Dolan proceeded to make a mad dash towards the Eskin Manor, but quite obviously, these people who are questioning his sins would not allow him to do that so easily. There were quite a few pugilists among them as well, so they all stepped forward to block Dolan's way. At another location, in the Eskin Manor, Orome was watching as two young children were talking about something. One of them was Parry who had lost his memories, while the other was Catho's younger brother, Ramilies. After learning of the name Negri, Orome had been searching as much as he could for all information related to it, hiring people to teach him and even ask the academy about this matter. Which Ramilies just happened to overhear while he was in class. Thinking of how busy his brother Catho was, as well as how the Juggers family was gradually falling to ruins, he volunteered his help to Orome. The Juggers family originally had close relations to Negri's ghost men in the past, so they were relatively knowledgeable about the Korchi people and race Dromia. Chapter 475 Volume 7 Chapter 13, Return of Evil Spirits Translator, La 009 Outside the Eskin Manor, a sneaky figure was silently observing the inside. 
since the boss had gone insane, people who do dirty work under them like him would naturally need to consider a way of retreat for themselves. Now that everyone's attention is drawn over there, it's best that I take this chance to threaten the last remaining member of the Eskin family and flee with their fortune. These were Ryan's thoughts. Observing the light that still hasn't been turned off in the reading room, Ryan frowned. He clearly remembers twisting Orom's neck and confirming that he had stopped breathing before he returned to report. Unexpectedly, that guy somehow crawled back to life the very next day, causing him to be punished, so now he's going to pay it all back in full. After waiting for the other side to go into complete chaos, Ryan snuck into the manor. There were only a total of three people in the entire Eskin Manor right now, the few new employees that they managed to hire were unwilling to live in the Eskin Manor. Because of this, this infiltration could only be said to be exceptionally simple, Ryan had practically walked into the manor through the front door and swiftly began his search. There wasn't actually a lot of wealth remaining in the Eskin Manor. No one was stupid so they clearly see the Eskin family with only one member remaining as a soft fruit to be squeezed, not to mention that the new Baron or Rome seemed to have actually become stupid due to the severe shock. Because of this, various debtors proceeded to look for him, saying that the previous Eskin Baron had collaborated with them and owed them money, so now that such a thing had happened to the Eskin family, their collaboration could no longer continue and the Eskin family had to reimburse them. None of their documents contained the Eskin family seal, so even if they were real, they were only the previous Eskin baron's personal debt, and Orom could easily use this to argue against them. However, Orom at the time didn't care about these matters, nor did he understand the market or tricks, so he very easily repaid their debts. Of course, even after doing that, the remaining wealth of the Eskin family was more than enough for Ryan to covet. After all, some of the aristocrats actually cared about their outer appearance and didn't try to devour the Eskin family whole. H.M. Someone just came in, while discussing matters within a certain book with the two children, Orome was surprised and suddenly said that. Ever since Orome learnt of, Bone Forge Art, through Parry, he had immediately begun to practice it. A lot of things that were exceptionally difficult for others were very easy for him. In a mere few days worth of time, he had already activated his bones' metallic characteristics. After all, the current Orome was nothing but a living being with a moat of dust as its core. He found it much easier compared to humans to control his own body, and the dust under his control had filled every corner of his body, aiding him in controlling it better. For the past few days, Orome had continuously absorbed knowledge like a sponge, so his mental capacity was already at a similar level to other humans, perhaps even superior in certain parts. His problem was that he didn't have the corresponding comprehension of human relations, desires, and emotions. That's why he understood that he wasn't safe and that those debtors had actually harbored malice towards him. In truth, if he didn't already have a certain level of common sense, he would have killed all of those people on the spot. This was because the malice they gave off told him that they wished for him to just drop dead, which caused the sensitive moat of dust to want to react accordingly. The human world wasn't safe and our own, as smart as he was, quickly analyzed the reason why the other party didn't try to kill him right away. During this period of time, the city enforcers had frequented his place, and the massacre had made such a huge impact that acting to kill him would easily cause issues. The aristocrat must keep their dignity. Even though Orome didn't feel like dignity could actually do anything at all. For that reason, Orome had remained constantly ready to face danger. He used his own superior control to practice, bone forge art, then used some of what was left of his family's resources to change out his blood. Recently, he had even begun to wonder what a pugilist heart was, as well as why comprehension and emotions would be able to help an individual manifest the most crucial aspect of their supernatural powers. 
Thanks to all of these factors, Orion was much stronger than others would think, not to mention he had the natural talent of controlling dust that was attracted by the core of his soul. The Eskin family might seem like it was unguarded, but various motes of unsuspecting dust had scattered all around the manor, ensuring that anyone who came inside would be essentially walking into Orome's network of surveillance. Right as Ryan entered the Eskin Manor in preparation to rob them, Dolan was also fighting as hard as he could to run towards the Eskin Manor. The Ashias family wasn't a particularly renowned or noble family. They didn't have any bloodline inheritance, nor did they have, Bone Forge Art, that had formed its own school. The most they had were some of the assassination techniques passed on throughout the generation of the Sacred Valley's assassins. They were essentially a family that was in the middle of the road. There weren't too many members in the Ashias family as a whole, which was why Dolan was able to use the family's resources to bring himself to the very limit despite his inferior bone talents. It wasn't until his son was born that he was moved by the combined emotions of family glory, bloodline continuation, as well as witnessing a new life, which stimulated his metal soul and manifested his own pugilist heart. For the same of his family's glory, Dolan Ashias had made a lot of effort and paid many prices, but he knew perfectly well that this was the limit of his abilities and that he would only become an entry-level pugilist at best. This was why he had placed his hopes in the bone of God, hoping to conduct a bone-swapping ritual to improve his son's bone talents as well as his family's bloodline as a whole. Any aristocrat can invite some particularly talented servants and help them become pugilists, who would then serve the family as their stewards in return, but those pugilists were very unreliable, with the case in point being that all three of the Ashias family's stewards had disappeared. All great clans must hold power directly in their hands. The threat of a first-rate pugilist didn't pale in comparison to a small army, and only families who had produced a first-rate pugilist would qualify to become a great clan. Outsiders can't be relied on or trusted, simply because of the difference in bloodline. Even if they accept stewardship, even if they truly pledge themselves to the family, they could only protect the family up until a certain point. Numerous examples of stewards ending up taking over the family had led these aristocrats to believing that only those from bloodline could be trusted. Only a strong individual would have the privilege of leaving descendants, as weaker individuals would suddenly notice one day that their descendants actually had no relations to themselves. People who had advanced and become pugilists and normal people were already two very different species. That was also why Dolan had hoped to find the bone of God. The Ashias family originated as part of the Sacred Valley, the bone of God was something that they had protected for generations and converting to this bloodline was actually a glorious matter. Life is always unpredictable and it wasn't until after his family had been all but destroyed that Dolan could finally sense himself advancing further as a pugilist. Like a madman, he attacked everyone who stood in his way, his heart filled with urgency had once again stimulated his metal soul, his vitality was rapidly being burnt away, opening a newer path of pugilist to him, as he had been able to grasp the internal life force of all things. If he could remain in this state, then he could have a chance to advance and become a first-rate pugilist. This state of continuous burning vitality was called burning soul steel tempering, which was also the symptoms of advancing to become a first-rate pugilist. This caused the pastors and aristocrats who stood in his way to all become startled. Don't panic, his body couldn't possibly support his advancement. In no longer than three minutes, he will have already burned himself to death. It simply wasn't simple to advance and become a first-rate pugilist. Mind-body skill, all three of these factors must reach a certain standard in order for it to be achieved. For the body obstacle, Dolan's body was originally honed through resources, his bone was also naturally inferior. For the skill obstacle, the Ashias families, bone forge arts, were only a bit better compared to what was being taught on the streets. 
Furthermore, ever since Dolan became a pugilist, by instinctively realizing that a higher level was impossible for him, he hadn't trained himself at all. Only the mind obstacle, after experiencing the death of his son and the fall of his family, after everything he cared about had already been destroyed, his current mental state where a tiny bit of hope had pulled him out of the abyss was just barely enough for Dolan to qualify. Under these circumstances, attempting burning soul steel tempering was basically suicide. I can sense it, that is parry, that is truly my little parry. Dolan didn't care about what others think, he finally managed to sense his own son's internal life force through their bloodline connection, confirming that he was indeed in the Eskin manner. Facing the frenzied Dolan, everyone very firmly took a step backwards. There was no reason for them to risk their lives against someone who would die in three minutes. As for whether or not he would cause senseless massacre after being released like this was of no concern to them, or rather, him doing that would only make it more convenient for them to place all the blame onto Dolan. Follow him closely, the bishop ordered, but suddenly realized that their surroundings were not quite right, since when did this fog? Bishop sir, it's no good, we're, a man with a panicked expression ran towards them, still calling out that it was no good, then told them in an eerie tone, we've lost our way. Watching as the bodies of ten young children slowly stood back up, Negri chuckled. These aristocrats and pastors also need a bit of urging.